Alrighty, well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Daphne. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. And it is my pleasure to present our speaker for today's author talk, Jason A. Cherry, who's gonna be talking about William Trent, the founder and the namesake of, of, of Trenton essentially, as well as the, the rise and fall of his proposed col colony Vandalia that I knew nothing about. And I'm sure some of you probably know nothing about either. It's kind of one of those hidden histories that, that Jason's going to uncover for us. So uh, Jason is a native of Butler, Pennsylvania and a 2002 graduate of the University of Massachusetts. Um, he has reenacted the French and Indian War for over 30 years, portraying the group of volunteers hired under William Trent Jr. in 1754, a unit known as Captain William Trent's Company. Uh, currently, he is the research consultant for the William Trent House in Trent, New Jersey, and works as an assistant group supervisor for Stepping Stones Children's Center in Gibsonia, Pennsylvania. Uh, on March 13th, 2024, his new book and biography, William Trent, Factor of Ambition, was released and met with grave reviews. So welcome again, Jason. Thank you so much for, for speaking to us today. Um, before we jump into Jason's presentation, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Um, first and foremost, we will be taking your questions at the end of Jason's presentation, but please feel free to submit them at any time to us using the Q&A or the chat feature in the Zoom dashboard. Um, as always, at the end of our webinar, you will be prompted to fill out a survey. If you have time, please complete the survey. Again, we always appreciate all the feedback that, that you give us. Um, and if you want more information on William Trent and the Trent family, you can visit the William Trent House website um, on the web address on the screen there. And they have a fantastic biography of all the residents, um, including William Trent Jr. Um, so you can learn more information there. And then one last thing before we jump into the presentation, I just want to do a brief overview of Zoom dashboard. This is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. If you're using a mobile device, the dashboard may look a little bit different, but all the features will still be there. Uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, you can check your audio settings. So if you're using an external listening device, like a headset or earbuds, you can check to make sure it's connected properly there. At any point during the presentation, if you have any issues, there is a raise hand button here in the middle. You can click on that and that'll alert me. I will send you a message in Zoom and hopefully be able to resolve any problems that you are having. And as I mentioned before, if you do have any questions, you can use the Q&A or the chat buttons to get in touch with us. We'll be happy to address them at the end of Jason's presentation. Um, so that is everything that I have for you. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Jason now. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, let's pull that. Okay. So yeah, this is a very... Uh, subject that I'm, you know, very, uh, very, um, you know, pleased to sort of present because it's, uh, like Andrew said earlier, it's sort of a forgotten uh, thing, not only about the, you know, about William Trent himself, uh, as far as an important figure in the 18th century, uh, history of 18th century, essentially, um, but just some, uh, an event that I think a lot of people don't really know about, where we, we hear about, of course, the, you know, the French Union War and the, uh, 17, late late 1750s, uh, early 1760s, and then we you know we hear about in the early 1760s uh, a basically an Indian uprising or what Trent would refer to as the late Indian War, uh, known as uh, Pontiac's uprising. Um, but then, as the American Revolution breaks out there, you know, with the Battle of Lexington Concord and, and further on, we don't realize what actually was going on behind the scenes. Uh, especially something that happened, uh, believe it or not, because I like to put it as uh, what was going on in London um, as, you know, before the conflict that basically put the world on its knees with the, you know, the outbreak of the American Revolution. So without further ado, we'll sort of begin this. And yeah, this is the, basically the colony called Vandalia, and I'll sort of show you the history about this. And as you can see uh, on your screen here, uh, you see a uh, thing that says Treaty with the Indians uh, at Fort Stanwyck, 1768. And this is where it sort of all began uh, to put the events in motion. This is the original um, journal that William Trent kept. It's in Philadelphia. Uh, over 100 pages worth of minutes that were kept at this uh, notorious, basically, Native Council or treaty uh, that eventually became um, what, like I said, set this in motion for uh, their events in, in London here. Uh, that basically got them a very ambitious way to hopefully propose a charter and uh, essentially uh, propose colony that they wish to do. So 
I guess we start, who was William Trent? Um, and I say he's the son of Judge William Trent. Judge William Trent, uh, of course, is the basically the namesake for uh, what we know today is Trent, New Jersey. Um, this was William Trent's father. Um, it, it, William Trent's father was a shipping merchant there in Philadelphia. And eventually, when he became into debt, he actually fled, believe it or not, the colony of Pennsylvania, buying land almost uh, 800 acres at one point and an additional 200 acres uh, there in what was known then as the Falls of the Delaware, a bigger Quaker settlement uh, founded by Malin Stacy. And basically, at that point, uh, William Trent would build a uh, house uh, that still stands today um, that would be completed by 1719. Um, and if you visit, you know, Trent, New Jersey uh, there and you cross the bridge off 95, uh, it's a it's a fabulous place uh, to visit and see, uh, you know, a Georgian style house uh, that was that's still standing uh, here today here in, uh, you know, in the 21st century. And at this point, this is where William Trent uh, essentially, based on my research, was born. Um, he was eventually, the, like I said, the settlement known as the Falls of the Delaware, a Quaker settlement, became then because of his father's, you know, being a wealthy resident there and owning the mills in the vicinity, um, they would call this Trent's town in honor of his of his father. And eventually it'd be shortened to just Trent, New Jersey, that we know today as New Jersey's capital. Um, and as Trent grew up, he be, eventually became a, he apprenticed to his uh, mother's cousin, Edward Chippen III. Uh, you, if you recognize that name, Edward Chippen III was uh, not only the founder of Chippensburg, Pennsylvania, um, but was also the uh, grandfather of a Margaret Shippen, the future wife of, of Benedict Arnold, known as Peggy Shippen. Um, and as he apprenticed a mercantile apprenticeship, Trent eventually would be, uh, as he would find from his master there, Edward Shippen III, um, would eventually look into the fur trade at the height there in the 1740s after he completed his by 1743. Um, and he became notorious there, him and his, his partner, George Crowen, uh, once known as King of the Tra Traders, uh, there in the Ohio country in the area there, uh, would eventually um, be notarized to the point that for every native house in Indian town that there was in the Western country or the Ohio country there, what we know today is Western Pennsylvania and even present day Western Ohio and Eastern Ohio, um, Trenton Crowen would have their name basically all over the place there. Uh, there wouldn't be a town that wouldn't whisper their name because they had some kind of trade goods there. And by doing so, he would be pretty notorious in what would be then uh, Cumberland County in 1749. And by 1751, when the Pennsylvania Assembly would uh, elect, he would be representative of Cumberland County. Uh, and it would be at this time that he would you know, go in October of 1751. Um, and arrive there and basically vote with those members of the Pennsylvania Assembly there at the uh, Pennsylvania State House right in the city. Um, he would join uh, not only f f basically fellow uh, names you would recognize, obviously the uh, clerk of the house was William Franklin, the, the son of Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was a representative there, at the Pennsylvania Assembly for Philadelphia County. Um, Isaac Norris was also a uh, at the time a speaker of the house, uh, the founder of Norristown. Um, what I take out of that was is William Trent and then would be part of that Pennsylvania Assembly that would vote to bring a newly casted, basically state house bell to Philadelphia there, and it would arrive eventually by 1752, um, and this new state house bell we know today as uh, the Liberty Bell. Uh, it would be a, uh, it's a they would have it voted for a cast in Whitechapel Foundry in the East End of London, uh, and it would be that that uh, William Trent would be a part of. And at about a year later, being that he was so notorious in the not only in the fur trade, but also the Western country, he would become uh, what was known as factor for the Ohio Company. This is one of the only signatures you can see on your screen of um, basically uh, of Trent um, um, signing his name and then putting factor for the Ohio Company underneath. Uh, the Ohio Company was the one of the largest land speculating agencies in the world. Uh, it started first as like landowner, wealthy landowners from the northern neck of Virginia, like uh, George Washington's older half brothers, Augustine and, and Lawrence. Eventually, uh, the Lee family, who helped co found this Ohio company. But then it spread to Maryland and other members that were able to afford uh, shares in the Ohio company. Um, and it would be pretty much the overall uh, who would have tried to control the Ohio Valley uh, at this time. And William Trent would be the factor, meaning he kept the books uh, and the financial uh, for this. Um, but then eventually he would, using this, uh, 
he would also, this ambition would make him a veteran captain of three different wars, uh, two of the conflicts uh, against the French. Uh, the first one being um, what was known then as King George's War, a, basically the the uh, colony version here uh, in the American colonies uh, for the o War of Austrian Succession. Uh, the French would come down from Canada and the uh, His Majesty King George II uh, at the time wished to hopefully uh, drive the French back through Canada there when they invaded the New England states. Uh, Trent would be a part of it, a captain, as well as a, uh, a compatriot, a young ensign, 16 years old, named William Franklin, uh, that would fight with William Trent here, being he was a commissioned captain by His Majesty there in an independent company, one of four uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, and I put this up here because this was the new manual exercise uh, that was given to these captains there in the basically the summer of 1746. Uh, it was printed first and arrived first at, at Benjamin Franklin's print shop there on Market Street, or was known as the Market there uh, in Philadelphia. And it would be, Trent would use this uh, drill and manual of exercise uh, to train his company of 106 men uh, there as they would train uh, locally uh, in the Philadelphia region. And then I said he was in a second war. This is a fabulous painting depicting uh, from Robert Griffin called uh, Trent and Half King at the Forks. Uh, the Half King being a very vocal leader of the Six Nations of uh, the time in, in the early 1750s. But this was to, to depict uh, essentially uh, the point there um, in the Forks of the Ohio. And uh, the Forks of the Ohio we know today is the present day Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this is the view from the Monongahela Riverside. Uh, the men arriving to hopefully build the first English outpost there on the high declivities there of the point or what we know today is Point State Park. For those of you familiar with Pittsburgh, uh, there's a large fountain. You see those trees there on the right hand side. Uh, the fountain would be there today. Uh, and then further on down beyond that ridge there where the men are canoeing in, uh, that is where it meets. The, uh, the Monongahela then joins the Allegheny on the other side of this these declivities to form the Ohio River, which you see in the distance uh, where the hills are. And then finally, after those two uh, fighting in those, and he also served um, in 1758 to basically retake the Forks of the Ohio that was eventually given, uh, his men was evicted of the French in the spring of 1754. In 1758, four years later, he would accompany as basically the assistant uh, superintendent of Indians um, for this expedition under General John Forbes, um, in which they would retake uh, what would be then the abandoned Fort Duquesne uh, essentially where uh, John Forbes would name it after William Pitt the Elder and call this um, uh, Pittsburgh at the time the way he was pronounced and uh, in those letters there in the fall of 1758. Eventually it'd be shortened and Americanized to uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania that we know today. And then finally, he would serve then at Fort Pitt as the originally just having a, a, a few stores. He had one of the largest uh, stores at Fort Pitt when it was built or starting to build from 1759 and completed by 1761. Uh, in the lower town, closer to the edge of the uh, the rivers there, Trent would have three houses there. One, he would sell a, a large store uh, customers, but after the, uh, as he would call it, the late Indian War, uh, he was forced to serve then with his veteran experience, being a veteran captain in two different conflicts already. The the commander, uh, seeming an equally a, would eventually uh, uh, have him serve then as promoted to a major and serve as the militia commander uh, to hold off the basically the assault by the uh, the neighboring natives that uh, basically had risen up against the uh, the fort there to the end of which he was be accommodated for uh, commended for uh, at the end there of by August of 1763. So that essentially is who William Trent was. Like I said, he was a veteran. He was very notorious, especially with the fur trade. And his reputation with the factor for being the factor for the Ohio Company uh, uh, speaks for itself and his reputation there. Because up to a point till uh, as we were going with this land company, it all began with this and his ambitions there uh, into the fur trade. So in the beginning, in 1763, uh, they would finally start to meet. Unfortunately, after the late Indian War and even after the French and Indian, a lot of these traders and uh, um basically men that were employed by Trent or even just were uh, that worked alongside Trent there uh, became into debt because of these wars and weren't able to get these repaid. And so they, in 1763, they decided to do something about it and they would meet uh, what was then known as the Indian Queen Tavern. And it was run by a, a John Little uh, tavern owner there. And as you can see, I'll show you the arrow pointing up, but it was at the corner of, of what we know today is uh, 
uh, Market Street and Fourth Street. Um, and they would meet there. Several others would meet his cousin, Samuel Burge, who was a saddler, uh, most of Philadelphia men. And he would also meet for the first time, uh, Quaker Samuel Wharton, who they would uh, get a, another merchant in Philadelphia and pretty well known with the Bain, Wharton and uh, Morgan, uh, basically mercantile firm that was pretty notorious out of Philadelphia and dealt in the uh, Ohio country. And at this point, William Trent would meet Samuel Wharton and they would draft a memorial there, sitting there together uh, at this thing at the, at the fourth and markets. And they would basically at the Indian Queen Tavern, which eventually became the sort of the Royal hangout. I always call it saying that uh, Samuel Adams had the green dragon uh, tavern in Boston and Trent and his, basically his um, men here of the, uh, would essentially be at one time the Ohio Company, then the Indiana Company, and those that had shareholders even in Vandalia um, would always meet at his, uh, he would inquire them to meet him at the Indian Queen Tavern there at 4th and Market. Uh, unfortunately, today it doesn't exist. Um, it was a well-known notorious tavern then. George Washington had visited there as well, as well as John Adams, even Thomas Jefferson. Um, but it was pretty well known there um, from the early 1750s on. But it would be the, basically the meeting and standing point of where these men would sit, draft a memorial that they would put to the crown. But unfortunately, the crown would sort of ignore it at this point in 1763 after uh, his partner, George Crone, would take it to London. Um, but they would keep, and he would basically keep trying. And uh, basically at this point, uh, collect more affidavits, more deaths that happened after the late Indian War, and hopefully propose to, to Congress uh, to set, hopefully, to get some reimbursement uh, for this. And uh, eventually they would. And as you can see, this today, and just to show you an idea where this tavern was, this is the Fox 29 building on 4th and Market. This would be where the uh, Indian Claver Indian Queen Tavern would be uh, presently today, the site of uh, today in, in Philadelphia. So at this time, as uh, five years or so go by, after <clears throat> basically keep writing to the Crown and, and writing petitions, um, they would sit with William Johnson, basically, in New London, Connecticut. They'd have to meet him in at that time in New London because um, from his house there on the Mohawk River, he was uh, had some ailments. And he was uh, basically going to the ocean to hopefully relieve himself of these ailments, um, which he wrote to, to William Trent and, and George Crone. And so they would meet him there. Uh, they would they would basically have, as Trent would put it, breakfast there in New London. But then they would travel back, heading hopefully to Johnson's house there in the Mohawk Valley. So they would they would basically travel down to Rye, New York. Uh, they would make many stops along the way, uh, you know, past New London. Eventually, till they made their way into what was then uh, Broadway of uh, New York City, Lower Manhattan Island, uh, of a place called Burns Coffee House. Trent would write the receipts up. He would have the, not only would they feed the horses when they did earlier in Rye, New York, but he would also have uh, women launder his clothes. Uh, along this journey here, uh, back in you know in in the September of of 1768, um, and then after that they would leave there and and head to staying at King's Arm Tavern in Albany, New York, a place that Trent was pretty familiar with back in 1746. I mentioned King George's War uh, as a as a commissioned captain there in the summer of 1746. They would be commissioned at Fort Frederick there. You can see a sort of a fort on the on the map there of all in the city of Albany. Um, but this would be Trent would stay at, at uh, Robert Clinch's Tavern there. Uh, King Arms in, in Albany, which they would stay the night and eventually head uh, up the river there, uh, up to the Mohawk River, to when they would get to Johnson Hall, um, or as it was known then in uh, basically Johnstown, New York, um, but would make arrangements then to meet with these uh, Indian nations, hopefully to get some reimbursement for what they lost, not only during the French and Indian, but also during the uh, French late Indian War, or what we know today is, uh, you know, Pontiac's Rebellion in 1763. And by doing so, Johnson, William Johnson, the superintendent of Indian affairs, um, would make arrangements of contacting all the Indian nations, but also um, make arrangements for 20 boatloads of presents. At this time, to tell you how, how massive this was, moving on here, as they would leave, after he'd make the arrangements from Johnson Hall, they would head to, the, to uh, Fort Stanwix there uh, in the basically early October or middle October of 1768. And it would be at that time in 1768, the largest native council ever assembled. Um, there was close to, according to the exact journal, what kept of uh, uh, William Trent kept there uh, of the time, there were close to over 2,200 Indians. But the, so well, you can see why they would need the 20 boatloads of, of presence there. And it began on October 24th, 1768. There in, uh, basically there's uh, Fort Stanwix there. 
Um, and they would begin this treaty. <clears throat> and it's just to show you how important this treaty was. There were very notorious individuals there. There was William Franklin there, the royal governor of New Jersey, um, and also son of, of Benjamin Franklin. And like I said, William Franklin and William Trent went back way back, actually. Um, like I said, William Franklin fought with in King George's War with William Trent there in 1746 as a teenager. Eventually in 1748, would accompany Trent and, and Conrad Weiser and George Crowan, uh, they would head to the Ohio country and basically hold the first native council, what was then of the Ohio country there in 1748. Um, and then eventually, um, William Franklin uh, would, they would keep in touch basically by correspondence and uh, meet up here at the, uh, like I said, the Treaty of Sandwich. So at Fort Sandwich there, he would be, as I was continuing, he would be elected then as the role of secretary. And he would basically pen the entire minutes. I showed you that, that earlier journal there treaty of uh treaty of stanwick's journal there 1768 it would be over 100 pages um that eventually he would complete when the treaty ended on um, they would sign basically a, a deed of session from the the, the six nation who at that agreed at that treaty in 1768 um felt responsible for at least the late indian war not necessarily the french and indian war but most mostly for the men that suffered and, and, and filed these affidavits which trent brought in the fall of 1768 um, they would basically come forward and sign this treaty. Um, and so then on November 5th, 1768, um, there would be a deed of session of land uh, in addition to the land. It was also over 80,000 pounds worth of debt that was accumulated from, from this, as of which the Indians agreed with this deed, um, excuse me, to basically a conditional sale of land that was equal to this over 80,000 pounds. Uh, to this land. And so then when it was officially uh, deeded on November 5th, 1768, Trent would take it to Philadelphia to get officially basically notarized and recorded. Um, and at that time, they would name it, at least temporarily on paper, it would be called Indiana uh, in honor of the of the Indians there. As you can see, when I bring up here, um, that's part of some of the writing there. Uh, Trent would, would write there uh, when he began the treaty there uh, in the Treaty of Stanwyck's Journal that I said is in Philadelphia. So at this time, the only thing they really needed at this point was to, with that deed of session um, that they signed at the Treaty of Stanwix, they needed his majesty's approval. They needed the Privy Council. They needed the London's highest court to approve this. If in fact they were gonna go with this uh, this deed of land uh, in, in debt here. So Trent would eventually, Samuel Wharton would leave first, arrive in the spring of 1769. And he would wait until Trent would eventually arrive. Trent, putting his fares in order, would sail then from Philadelphia. And this is basically the advertisement in the Pennsylvania Gazette uh, you know, uh, there uh, for what was then known as the Betsy, which which William Trent traveled on um, with Seymour Hood there, um, basically uh, traveling then to, to London. Now, unfortunately, um, it was rough sailing. And Trent said it was anything but uh, a basically a, a comforting voyage. Um, arriving basically, he, he was delayed actually because of a storm uh, there uh, by the Irish Sea that eventually he would have to stay a week in Ireland Then eventually getting to Bristol where he would, as he would write uh, in one of his letters there, uh, he would take a, a flying machine, uh, which was the notorious term for a very wealthy genteel carriage, they called it, uh, as you can see in this picture here. It was basically it had springs in the bottom and it would basically cover Bristol to London, a normally three-day journey. Uh, almost two days. It was a quick journey. Uh, if you could afford it, um, you could get there very quick, which was hence the nickname, uh, a flying machine. Um, and his one of his first stops, as he finally arrives in London there on May 25th, 1769, is at the time 27 Craven Street, uh, along the main highway basically called the Strand, uh, which was near uh, the main, the central part of, of London called Charing Cross. Uh, there would be a street there heading eastward, um, basically northeastward, um, called the Strand, and he would stop at 27 Craven Street. And at 27 Craven Street was the home of, or basically a renter, Benjamin Franklin, house owned by uh, housekeeper Margaret Stevenson, uh, rented the Benjamin Franklin from a 16 years there. Um, originally, they would change some addresses when the initial thing went off when Trent arrived in 1769. It was known as 27 Craven Street. Eventually, when they redid the numbers, added a, a couple buildings there earlier in the street on Craven, I uh, became 36 Craven Street that is known today here in London. And if you visit it, it's the only known, uh, if you visit London uh, in England there, is the only known at that time uh, 
standing structure of Benjamin Franklin that still exists today there. And it would be at this at this house of, of Benjamin Franklin there on Craven Street that he would meet with Benjamin Franklin and also his uh, compatriot there in this guest parlor. Uh, as you can see, this is the original parlor uh, that probably Trent and uh, his compatriot there for uh, their memorial that they were trying to petition for the uh, Privy Council, Samuel Wharton. Uh, Benjamin Franklin would meet there and they would have uh, would dine and then talk about their next move of approaching Parliament and the Privy Council to hopefully get their their debt the final approval by His Majesty and the uh, uh, Privy Council there uh, in the, the summer of 1769. So as they're talking with Franklin about how to approach this, he, he made comments, Trent would make comments in a letter home uh, in June of 1769 talking about um, not only their business there, but talking about Samuel Wharton's ability to make friends there in Parliament while he'd been there a few months before Trent. And now that was their end as far as getting in there to hopefully approach the Privy Council and, and conduct a meeting, which was hard in itself. Um, the King had just celebrated a birthday there on June 4th, 1769. So it was there were celebrations and the Privy Council was uh, basically adjourned until further notice until they could uh, trust an audience. Um, but at the same time in this letter, as, we're, as Trent is talking about his business, Benjamin Franklin's also talking about his business in London. And he talks about, believe it or not, uh, wiring and heating at St. Paul's Cathedral and the House of Commons in Parliament. Um, basically, on as you can see, that's a picture of St. Paul's Cathedral there in London and uh, a picture there of the House of Commons. Uh, they're listed. Both of these, he would put what was then wiring and lightning rods there by the fall of 1769 atop there, basically to conduct experiments and to prevent them from being, you know, strikes of, uh, with light. And believe it or not, um, one of the last lightning rods there in, in St. Paul's Cathedral um, still exists. They took it down there to avoid uh, trying to preserve it. And it's in the Science Museum in London. Um, and believe it or not, this is dated 1769, uh, the picture you see here. And in fact, um, uh, it would eventually, like I said, it would be pretty much the same lightning rod that Trent would be mentioning when he uh, would write to George Crow in there from Franklin's house. Uh, there in the basically in June of 1769. So Franklin suggests that they meet with the potential shareholders that already drafted in the memorial, uh, those that were present already, and the ones that they could present to to get potential shareholders there for this potential, what they like I said on paper, they called Indiana. Um, so they arranged a secret meeting because at this time, this is by almost late 1769, yes, there's unrest in the colonies and, and stuff that's going on in Parliament, they don't want. Uh, people basically to know about. So they arranged a secret meeting basically with some former members, some active even in Parliament currently. Um, and they meet what was known then as the Crown and Anchor Tavern along the Strand, actually a little further past Benjamin Franklin's house there. Um, and this, as you can see, St. Clement's Danes Church uh, there on the, on the left in this uh, basically black and white sketch. But at the bottom where the arrow shows, that's where the Crown and Anchor was. It was a large meeting house, as they would describe it even today as a meeting house for radicals. Uh, so you can only imagine the the kind of characters that would have approached in there. Uh, and it would be a place there that Trent uh, and Franklin and about, I believe, 14 other shareholders would meet there uh, for Indiana. At least proposed at that time on how they would approach the Privy Council. But Trent keeping the notes and basically the minutes of every meeting and drafting or what petitions and different things that they could give to their solicitor, John Dagg, attorney that they could give eventually to hopefully set up a meeting. And today, if you visit London, yeah, this is still, you can see St. Clement's, uh, St. Clement Dane's Church there on the Strand, uh, peaking the sort of the top of the church, peaking above the trees. And right here on the corner is where the, the tavern today would stand. Uh, believe it or not, it's a, like a cafe style today. So it's still, even back this many years today, it's still something that um, is similar to what it was then uh, and in, in 1769. As they were able to finally get a, in the summer, it wouldn't be till the summer of 1772 would they finally get an actual meeting with the Privy Council. Um, Trent, I know Franklin, Benjamin Franklin and Samuel Wharton would try to get an audience and would, would meet with a few members of parliament, but this was official. They, the Privy Council agreed to meet on their petition. Uh, the board of present Board of Trade, uh, Lord Hillsborough would also hear them out. And Trent would be busy basically writing out the petition of which he also realized, too, that he needed to dress the part going in here, uh, 
to the Privy Council there. So he would go to Spitalfields, the east end of London, where the French silk weavers uh, would dwell and basically reside, and he would have a suit made. Now, today, it was it would be a three-piece cork suit specifically made for this thing in the summer of 1772, um, but this is the only known existing piece of it and anything that was owned by William Trent. Uh, this was a basically uh, the waistcoat or vest of a court suit that Trent would uh, eventually wear when he visited there to and address the Privy Council there in the summer of 1772. Uh, you can see it's just uh, founding the 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 detail of not only made of silk but also the embroidery and the flowering brocades that adorn basically the buttons and everything here. And it was only him, but also Benjamin Franklin would have a similar type silk suit as would Quaker Samuel Wark. Um, so when they were granted that audience, then you can see sort of a zoom in a little bit. Um, they would go then, the Privy Council would meet what was known then as the Court of St. James. And it was there in this center building here, sort of looks like a octagon shaped. It was called the basically the cockpit. And it was because it was the only remaining and surviving building that survived the fire in the 1690s from Henry VIII's uh, Whitehall Palace. And at this time, the cockpit was known where, where they would have the basically the cockfights during um, in this palace that Henry VIII put on for entertainment. And being this was now the the king's, basically King George III's, his majesty's highest court. This is where uh, William Trent and several others would address then the Privy Council uh, to go to. And by doing so, they would address, they were suggested at one point when they said they wanted so many acreage, possibly a couple million acres, uh, to basically... Uh, fulfill this debt or session or conditional land um, for this Indiana. But it was suggested by the President Board of Trade that they needed something bigger. Maybe they wanted to propose a royal colony, make it almost 20 million acres, and they would maybe have a deal. So they would. It would suggest this. Um, but the next thing Trent would lobby, and he would do so first when they first addressed the Privy Council, they would basically say, where would the capital be for this, for this large colony uh, that was going on? Where would they have, where would the royal governor dwell? Where would the Capital B now suggested Philadelphia, Williamsburg, but unfortunately, neither one of these were were easily apparent in this proposed colony, and it was deemed too far. Basically, Trent would lobby that Pittsburgh would be perfect because the top of this colony, and uh, basically, would be where uh, they could use Pittsburgh as being the basically the residence of the governor, and it would be more suitable because it was already in within the colony, within the borders of this projected colony. Um, and they would call this, <clears throat> excuse me, they would call this colony basically, uh, it would begin after this meeting here, the Privy Council, that uh, who would eventually basically give them, you know, grant them that uh, the petitioners basically rule in favor of them um, there on July the 1st, 1772. Um, they would address it as Pennsylvania, naming it for William Pitt the Elder, uh, the former prime minister uh, of of. England there, and basically who they named uh, when Trent was on that Forbes expedition there in 1758, I mentioned earlier, uh, what they'd named Pittsburgh after as well. What was suggested there being that the capital was there, why name the colony Pennsylvania? Now, this would last until 1773 um, there, and you can see a picture there of William Pitt the Elder. And as they officially agree, it was a great victory for these American constituents. Now, like I said, it wasn't just American. There was Samuel Wharton, Benjamin Franklin. Um, but there was also, as you can see, uh, Benjamin Franklin in that picture. There was also a, a fellow friend of Benjamin Franklin named Edward Bancroft, uh, who would eventually accompany him to France and be one of his, uh, basically, assistants as he would lobby uh, for France's support there uh, during the outbreak of the American Revolution. Edward Bancroft, as you see in that black and white photo next to Benjamin Franklin, uh, believe it or not, in 1777, it wouldn't be found out till later after his death. Uh, in 1818, uh, that Edward Bancroft was actually a double agent, worked for the British Secret Service, believe it or not, from 1777 on. So anything that was uh, correspondence or anything was given to anything of uh, British horses and things in London there, as of which Trent uh, would write to him many years after 1777, not, not knowing, as well as Benjamin Franklin not knowing, that Edward Bancroft was in fact in the... Uh, was anything that he was getting in correspondence was giving to you know, any agents uh, that were there in high, higher ups in the Privy Council and also in London, anything that was considered to be discreet. Um, there would also be Matthew Featherstone, a very wealthy 
financier that would join. Uh, he would build a house there right on Whitehall, what we know today is Whitehall Road in, in London. And he would build a house, the Dover House, where now the Scottish and uh, United Kingdom cabinets use uh, uh, today uh, for their basically their official business. Um, there would also be on the English side, there would be Honorable Thomas Walpole, a basically a member of parliament currently at that time and was also a former president of the East India Trading Company in the 1750s. Um, very well known and very high up in London, as well as this man here, Anthony Todd, who was the London postmaster uh, there. And he would be the one that would handle all the letters being back and forth from the American colonies to London and from London to the American colonies and anything sent out. And would he'd be the one that would basically scout out and make sure there weren't treasonous things written uh, in the letters. But it was somebody that they needed to have on their side if they were to continue this proposed colony. And like I said, Pennsylvania was till about 1773. Um, this is what they eventually, after they were approved there on July the 1st, 1772, would actually made the paper the next day. And the Oxford Journal would actually write and say that um, was basically uh, a basically a, a accepted by the petitioners uh, for this 20 million acre. And it would they would mention by name several lords, as well as uh, Benjamin Franklin and Samuel Wharton, in other words. And the next step, now that they were officially approved by the Privy Council and the Board of Trade, would be to send it to the final approval to Solicitor General Alexander Wedderburn, um, who eventually, all he had to do was sign his name and this official proposed charter and then eventual colony could be approved. And it, like I said, it was a, a well-known sort of victory that happened on July 1st, 1772, that you got to understand with the unrest in the colonies there, things that are going on. Uh, basically, you know, riotous stuff that's happening in Boston, Philadelphia, and other places uh, in, in the American colonies. In the summer of 1772, it was considered a, geez, uh, amazing victory, of which Reverend William Hanna, basically a companion of not only Trent Wart, but also a very good friend of Sir William Johnson, the you know, superintendent of Indian Affairs, where they uh, met up. And he would describe the event that happened on July 1st, being that he was in the cockpit with William Trent, as a most extraordinary matter and what no American ever accomplished before. And that's a great quote uh, to use, especially that what was going on when we know the date of 1772 and what's to come here in the next three or four years uh, uh, with, with Great Britain. And as you can see, I also added to William Trent's signature of the time. Sadly, uh, no, at this time, no actual painting or sketch is known to exist of William Trent, um, but his penmanship still survives today, as well as that coat I showed you uh, earlier there, um, which is just um, astounding to me. But despite this approval, um, there still was some opposition. Lord Hillsborough, I mentioned the president of the Board of Trade, opposed this from the day one, and he already delayed it even to, to be why probably it took three years for them to finally get an audience with the Privy Council. And this is Lord Hillsborough here. Um, and because of the unrest, he sort of drug his feet on everything to a point that he, even after their approval, it sent shockwaves there to the Board of Trade. But by August, basically August 14th, 1772, or August 13th, 1772, um, basically those members of parliament uh, that were in fact favored for this supposed royal colony there of Pennsylvania um, opposed Lord Hillsborough. As of which, it forced him to resign, and then he was replaced by basically the Earl of Dartmouth or Lord Dartmouth. Um, the Dartmouth University that we know today is is named for him, and he would be the replacement as the president board of trade. And immediately, he was basically replaced Lord Hillsborough on August thirteenth, August fourteenth, the very next day. First thing he does is order a business. He approves the uh, proposed charter on August fourteenth, seventeen seventy two. He's the one who signature that was sent to the Solicitor General. Um, but at this time, they realized to even get more support, this isn't ambitious enough to call it Pennsylvania. So they name it Vandalia. Why was it named Vandalia? Well, it was to honor Queen Charlotte. And believe it or not, it was to honor Queen Charlotte because, as they would be written in a few letters that Trent would send home, as well as Samuel Wharton to his cousin Thomas, um, they would write and say that it was to honor her ancestral background to to help get their official colony through by honoring the wife of his majesty by saying that Queen Charlotte had descended from basically the Vandalic tribes of Southern Europe and Northern Africa. And this is why they to give tribute and honor to her by naming this Vandalia. 
And as you can see, this is sort of a letter here that actually says, um, signed the letter, there's a, there's a postscript that says, the province is named Vandalia in honor of our queen and not Pennsylvania, just so they could recognize when they were writing home that there is a new name now uh, known as Vandalia. So as this Vandalia colony is basically formed, the it is considered now, okay, we, we, we feel the capital is going to be in Pittsburgh. Who could be governor? Who would be the royal governor of this colony as they're waiting on approval from the solicitor general? Now, there were two men that came to mind, and just to give you an idea of what Vandalia looked like, this is um, basically what the entire 20 million acres would look like of Vandalia. As you can see, it went as high as Pittsburgh there, being on the just on the borders there of the Forks of the Ohio, up into basically a little bit of, 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 West, of West Virginia, I'm sorry, of the tip of West Virginia and eastern Ohio, uh, a little bit southwestern Pennsylvania, into West Virginia, Virginia, and parts of Kentucky, believe it or not. And this is to show the original Indiana grant, which they proposed, of which then ambitiously they changed to Vandalia for the 20 million acres. And this would have been the colony had they um, had this gone through. And so the two potential governors, we have George Mercer of Virginia. Now, George Mercer was another uh, friend of and member of the Ohio Company. So he knew William Trent very well, uh, was actually, uh, would, had to flee Believe it or not, Virginia, he became a basically the stamp collector, uh, collected taxes there during the Stamp Act and was forced to flee to London. And he'd been living there ever since, um, basically since 1765 when the Stamp Act was passed and released to the colonies. Uh, he fled basically for his life from Virginia and stayed in London. But at this time, he was still representing the Ohio Company and when it opposed to, to this, produ this production of what they were trying to propose here, Trent Morton and others, he eventually would, would transfer uh, the Ohio Company and sort of joined with what was known, their company known as the Grand Ohio Company, um, basically as the shareholders of Vandalia. And it would be George Mercer that would basically trade in his, what, what, what uh, stake he had in the Ohio Company or shares in Vandalia. Then, of course, we have Samuel Wharton. Uh, the sketch, basically, um, that he would basically have there. And Samuel Wharton would be the one that uh, both, it's funny, both colonies and newspapers uh, of Pennsylvania and also Virginia, where George Mercer was from, uh, would basically say either one of them would be the, the proposed governor. Um, George Mercer, as early as 1773, would be proposed being the next Governor, he would even write a letter home saying, I haven't been named it yet, but hope hope soon to be named uh, governor of Vandalia. Um, Samuel Wharton was so confident that he was going to be named. Uh, he, believe it or not, would, as you can see here popping up here, write blueprints and sketch them in a letter for Trent to send home to George Crowan, eventually to stake out his governor's mansion that he wished to have built, to which another mansion built, also where Fort Pitt or where the settlement of Pittsburgh lied. And basically start, basically, he sent home uh, seeds from uh, gardens in London to start his governor's garden, uh, being that he was so confident that uh, he would be governor. Now, bring up a, a valid point here. Um, it was believed that at this time, as Vandalia was approved, and if it was to be a, a royal colony, they would have to basically follow not only with being a royal charter, but also with the Church of England. And being, do, being so, Quaker Samuel Wharton, a devout Quaker, uh, would not have been elected governor um, at this time, eventually, because of his being a Quaker. Um, so it would have leaned heavily, possibly, to George Mercer um, being the the proposed governor had this uh, gone through, uh, just to bring up a point. And as we get closer on, I say 1773, and you got to watch the date here, because by December of 1773, uh, with the Boston, with the basically the Riotous Acts, with the Boston Tea Party against the Tea Acts, um, the Solicitor General was just like the Earl of Hillsborough, Lord Hillsborough, where he drug his feet on this, knowing that there was unrest in the colonies and not really trusting uh, his American constituents to have this going. So he basically, from 1773 and almost into 1774, uh, would not give any approval. And all he needed was a signature to give this official charter. Um, and as this is going on, Fort Pitt, uh, the place where, where Samuel Wharton hoped to build his governor's mansion, uh, is claimed by Virginia Governor Lord Dunmore. And eventually, Fort Pitt, as writing from home, George Crowan would write to William Trent, 
there in the beginning of 1774, uh, saying that Fort Pitt had changed his name to Fort Dunmore uh, by doing so. So this sort of put a wrench in their plans. Then to further complicate this in the early January of 1774, Benjamin Franklin uh, is accused of treasonous acts uh, in supposed letters that were published uh, in the colonies, um, deposing Governor Hutchison from Massachusetts and their uh, basically acts against the uh, basically the crown in, uh, of Great Britain. And by doing so, Franklin would have to approach Alexander Wedderburn, the same man that needed to pu- prove their in Delia Colony, and this is sort of a painting of this, of Benjamin Franklin going before the cockpit once again, uh, about a year, basically two years later here, um, and basically being uh, not only accused, but um, ridiculed for his act in supposed treasonous letters, which supposedly was um, uh, basically front-run by uh, Sons of Liberty basically founder Samuel Adams, who published these in the Massachusetts paper and, and had it circulated throughout the colonies and also sent to London, as of which Franklin would go before the cockpit and he would be stripped of his postmaster general of the colonies uh, duties at the time. And it would be, this would be the turning point that Benjamin Franklin, and by 1775, uh, there would be no turning back. And if there was any type of reconciliation, because we have to understand at this time, in 1773 and even 1774, though there were riotous and unrest in the colonies, there were some that still wished that they could reconcile with Great Britain. And at this point, if there was any turning point in Benjamin Franklin's life, it was now. And when this happened in 1774, Benjamin Franklin realized that it, this was not going to work to reconcile with Britain. He would eventually sail out there uh, in the spring of 1775, him and his grandson Temple, um, and he would just basically return to the American colonies. All of which, Trent realizing that they still needed that approval from Alexander Wedderburn, were they ever going to get it? And they weren't sure. And he didn't want to wait around because the more he waited around with the unrest in the colonies, the danger it was. And he realized maybe it was fact that we go and claim this. He goes to Pittsburgh. He starts building this governor's mansion for Samuel Wharton. And maybe by then it'll be, a, it'll be, they'll have a jump on once the approval is met by the solicitor general. So Trent would eventually leave there in April of 1775. And as he would leave, he would basically get his affairs in order. They would have one last meeting uh, in secret at the Crown and Anchor. He would eventually take all the papers and official things, correspondence and letters he would take um, from Vandalia. And before he would leave, he would take a letter from Margaret Stevenson that she would write to Benjamin Franklin, basically asking about his family and asking about Temple. Um, And then he would also take with him what was then known and what was recently announced there in the spring in 1775, the Restraining Acts, which forced... Basically, colonies of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and all the mid-Atlantic states to, uh, tr- you know, straining them basically from their trade outside of Great Britain. And it would be at this point that it would not been announced, it wouldn't be enacted until almost August of 1775. So when Trent took this with him, this was a major risk, uh, being that he was smuggling this and the letters to Benjamin Franklin uh, on a ship um, there from London, hopefully to the colonies. Uh, knowing how dangerous it was. Um, So he would leave then in April 1775. He would leave on the Sally. This is the advertisement um, for the Sally there in the Kentish Gazette. Um, And he would leave what was called known as the Woolkey Custom House. It was right in the shadow of the Tower of London in London on the Thames there. Um, And he would leave from there, uh, basically having hopefully better accommodation than he did coming in on the the Betsy there, coming to London, uh, returning there. And so, but they would make several stops. They would stop you know, for Margate, uh, they would go past basically the White Cliffs of Dover, and then eventually they would stop one more in Portsmouth. Um, and by in Portsmouth, there would be a letter that Samuel Wharton would meet riding a coach, and he wouldn't ride home with Trent on the ship. He wanted to stay and continue the business and hopefully get the approval from Wedderburn uh, for their Vandalia. So from him staying, he did send a letter home dated April 17th, 1775, um, to give to Trent to give to Benjamin Franklin. And by doing so, they were made aware of a possibly a spy on board. Um, and as you can see, this is the harbor, um, and this is where they would have sailed from in London. And this spy that's on board, aboard the ship of the Sally, they identify as uh, Major Philip Skeen. Skeen had just been recently named the basically governor of Ticonderoga and Crown Point at that point uh, in the basically spring of 1775. Now, unbeknownst to Philip Skeen, uh, in May, as Trent would sail out there on basically in, in April, basically the late April of 1775, 
Uh, of course, in May of 1775, Ethan Allen and, and other uh, members of the New Hampshire Grants would eventually uh, um, go and, and basically take over and, and uh, like Hunter Rogan found points, um, giving a small victory before uh, just soon after the first shots of Lexington conquered. And we mentioned that knowing that uh, the letter that was sent uh, identifying Philip Skeen as a spy was dated April 17th, 1775. And you figure this was two days before the actual first shots or the shot heard around the world on April 19th. So they would sail not knowing any idea what was going on in the colonies. But they did see something that sort of gave a, a, an intimate foreshadowing. As they're in Portsmouth, it's mentioned by name, that they see the Cerberus. Now, the Cerberus, this is a picture of eventually the burning of Charlestown and the battle of eventually what was known as Battle of Breed's Hill or known as Bunker Hill. Um, the Cerberus. A military ship was being loaded up with supplies uh, there. And also on this Cerberus docked in Portsmouth that Samuel Wharton and William Trent would see, um, they would see Lord Howe, General Henry Clinton, and, Gen and basically General John Burgoyne. All three generals loading up and waiting for a favorable wind to sail to Boston. As you can know, two of these, Clinton and Howe, would take part in the Battle of Bunker Hill, but all three would be notorious generals during the, uh, the American Revolution and would be, be very prominent. So if there was anything that was going on, Trent and Wharton saw it firsthand, uh, basically by witnessing these three generals and the Cerberus being ready to dock in a favorable wind of leaving Portsmouth. Trent would eventually arrive back on June 7th um, there, uh, as of which Philip Skeen would be arrested there uh, in Philadelphia. And he would eventually give his letters there to make sure, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. He would give his letters then to Benjamin Franklin uh, and the restraining acts to the Senate Continental Congress. And he would return eventually back to his um, eventual life in, in Trenton, of which he would purchase uh, 700, almost 700 acres. The major plantation was a former home of Thomas Lambert about a mile and a half south of Trenton, New Jersey, where he first grew up and was born. And he would run a ferry service at this point. And this is the, the, the charter of this. He owned 570 acres and an additional 110, so almost 700 acres at this point. that he would do this and run what was known as the New Ferry or the Lower Ferry, eventually became known as even the Continental Ferry because Trent would give um, a discounted ferry service to any active military men of the Continental Army. And as he's trying to get back to basically civilian life here in 1775, he hears from Samuel Wharton that Solicitor General Alexander Wedderburn has approved Vandalia, but unfortunately has shelved the charter with the outbreak of the American Revolution. And with the outbreak of the American Revolution, they refused to do anything to promise this charter until the hostilities had ended. And unfortunately, we know how long the war ends. Uh, so Trent would eventually... Uh, pursue his old Indiana grants, uh, basically doing so. Um, and this is basically this picture I show you today is part of the original land. This is Riverview Cemetery in Trenton, uh, part of the Quaker burying ground as well, uh, where Trent would lie there a mile and a half south of Trenton. Um, there's some notorious, not only Civil War generals, but also the uh, John Roebling, Brooklyn Bridge uh, engineer, Brooklyn engineer, uh, basically are, is buried in the cemetery as well. Um, and at this time, as Trent's pursuing the, the original, basically, grant of Indiana, knowing that Vandalia is shelved for now, um, he runs into debt. And it, at this point, he runs into problems with opposition from Virginia. Now, Benjamin Franklin had warned him that supposedly men like George Washington and others, Virginia, that fought in the French Indian War would basically oppose these grants because they sort of overlapped. Um, but Trent was persistent, and he would spend almost the next eight years pursuing Indiana. Um, trying to at least get some kind of selling off shares. He would even sell shares to John Paul Jones, uh, William Grayson, a, a Virginia uh, assemblyman. And but unfortunately, by 1782, Virginia would block the original grant, the assembly in Williamsburg, um, meaning that they could no longer pursue it. And Indiana was basically dead in the water. And at this point, Trent was running into miles and miles of debt. Um, but there was also issues too, because as Vandalia was on hold, and Trent was running into debt, being that he was blockaded with Indiana. There were several others that ran into financials. His his former financier, uh, I mentioned before, Matthew Featherstone, would have a tower built on his property in South Hardings, 
uh, on Upmark Estate called the Vandalia Tower. You can see this picture here. He called it Vandalia Tower in honor of that. That's the picture even today of black and white there in the 50s. Um, it still resides today on the property. Um, it was also the Honorable Thomas Walpole would have a summer estate basically in the country of, of Sutton. Uh, basically, he would call this house here uh, Kershalton House, but he also named it the Vandal House in honor of Vandalia. And unfortunately, like Trent uh, trying to pursue these ambitions, he unfortunately, um, these would be known as follies. And as Trent would fall in further and further in debt, his health would, would ail. Um, and eventually to a point, he couldn't even afford his mortgage on the, the previous house that I showed you in the plantation. To a point that it would accumulate to almost 12,000 pounds, at least just for the mansion and estate, not even the debt that he accumulated going over there in London uh, to pay for his finances. You figure he was there from 1769 to 1775, almost six years of, of spending and financing and trying to sell off shares that were almost deemed worthless at this point, uh, being that today his losses would have been almost millions in today's money. By doing so, he basically moves what, what little he has left to greenering black trunk that holds only bundles of papers from previous land dealings. Him and his wife moved to Philadelphia and unfortunately would, would be laid to rest in a potter's field um, in what was known known today as Washington Square. Back then it was known as Southeast Square, one of the original squares that was laid out by William Penn there in Philadelphia. This is today a picture of Washington Square and B would wear most of the, it was a potter's field where those penniless and in poverty uh, would eventually be laid to rest. Uh, and it's probably where the reside of, uh, like I said, the where William Trent's final resting place would be there. Um, here in Washington Square, he is supposedly laid there. The Potter's Field is home to at least 30,000 least known continental soldiers, those that died poverty stricken lives and, you know, enslaved and, and different things that were buried in the square uh, underneath this ground of this sort of pile of ground here. Um, and it's unfortunate because it was a, uh, this ambition that Trent basically pursued for almost 30 years in 1754 when he tried to eventually get debts from stuff he lost during the Forks of the Ohio and, and in the French Indian War, um, he eventually failed at doing so. And it was sort of a rise and fall. And like I said, it was a, a well-known thing because what happened over there in London was very, um, he, him and, and Benjamin Franklin and Samuel Wharton, this was a such an accomplishment what they had when they were up there at a point and if the revolution doesn't break out it could have been possibly a 14th colony a colony named Vandalia that Trent would we know more about not only about this colony but about himself even in the history books and that's why even today I try to pursue this and why I wrote this uh, biography a William Trent Factor of Ambition to show these are the men behind the scenes that really come through and are the are the backbone of what we know today, the birthplace of America as we start celebrating here uh, in, you know, in 2025 and 2026 and further on here as, as the birth of America here in, in you know, in, in July of 2026 here. And I feel like to end this right here, this is the, basically the thing, and I, I love this quote that's on, this is in Washington Square Park in Philadelphia, uh, knowing this quote that Trent sort of, sort of the, deemed this quality of, that freedom is a light for which many men have died in darkness, being that it's, he's one of these contributors that sort of doesn't get his limelight, but, you know, hopefully telling his story today and every day as I go on and, and tell this story of, of his life, people can get a, get a sense of who these men were, who these important figures were, of not just the founding fathers, but those behind the founding fathers that really played a role in uh, not only the 18th century, but American history. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, if anybody does have questions, send them our way. Um, we'll be happy um, to address them. Uh, I know Jason and I, we, we talked a little bit beforehand, um, but can you talk a little bit about the, the background, your interest in this um, in, in this topic? Yeah, I mean, it, it was one of those things where um, it started out, yeah, my parents were both teachers and uh, we were big on history and we had actually, when I was younger, I was about 10 years old, 1990, um, we came across a group that does living history in the 18th century, French Indian War reenactors, and they were Pittsburgh based. And they, oh, what's the group you belong to? Well, it's called Captain William Trent's Company. They're really interested. We're looking for members. And, you know, uh, my brother and I was 10 at the time, my brother was six. And it was, you know, my parents were like, yeah, it might be something we want to do. We're pretty, um, we're pretty close as far as um, everything. And, and so at this point, being that we decided that, you know, 
my parents went to some meetings. They joined this living history group, and that's it, it said over thirty, you know, at this point, almost thirty-five years at this point, knowing living history and about uh, Captain Trent and what he did here in not only Western Pennsylvania, but as I pursued it further, I realized how many people didn't know who even William Trent was in certain events, even that were important. So it was one of those things where you're we sharing with people. That's what got me started, and realized that you know this was what we needed to. I needed to basically educate people that they could get his name out there. What we not only what we portrayed for living history, but who William Trent was as a person. The more I pursued, the more I realized what a fascinating figure he was because he wasn't just behind the scenes on some stuff. He was involved. You know, I mentioned the Liberty Bell and different things like that stuff that's very important today that he was somewhat a part of. And if it was a Native treaty in the mid 18th century, he was probably a part of it. And it was, you know, it was basically, I'm just going to here and put that on. But um, so it was one of those things where that's what got me involved. And like I said, the more I go out here and do these events every year, I feel like, um, you know, this this is what I set out to do is, to, you know, even if I can, you know, educate or and talk to somebody at least one time to tell them what, you know, how important, you know, the history was, not only in the 18th century, but just the William Trent himself. Um, were any of the Lenape Lenape who moved out of Jersey and Pennsylvania present at Fort Stanwix? Yes. And that's the, you know, you know, we look at that standpoint, you know, unfortunately the, the Lenape Lenape, especially when the, were, were apparent even in the early, right before William Trent's father would eventually move there to the falls of the Delaware, they were apparent there on those lands originally, and then would eventually be moved into Eastern Pennsylvania. And then eventually when the, and family decided to do the basically the walking purchase there in, in 1737. They were pushed further west, even into the Forks of the Ohio. Now, at that time, um, you know, and even then, now even today, unfortunately, the Len Lenape are basically those that are descendants of these of these ones that were basically driven from their land. They reside today in Oklahoma, sort of unknown today, but uh, do a lot of stuff with uh, or Pitt Museum, and it's great to see them part of it because they are, you know, unfortunately they. Not, Fortunately, they are a part of our of their history. And at, at Fort Stanwix, the big thing is that with all these nations that were there, and I think the biggest controversy for that was that six nations would sign the, the sessions of peace, but not necessarily all the Indian nations there. Six nations were the main ones, and I think that it was affected because the Lenny Lenape, even though some were possibly apparent, most of them watch their land, especially where the Western country, the Ohio country was, the Ohio Valley. Um, that was basically their sort of adopted lands because originally it was Eastern Pennsylvania, Western New Jersey. Um, so it was sort of an awkward and even more awkward was the Treaty of Stanwix, you know, Fort Pitt in 1763 would have a controversy with uh, the blankets from the smallpox hospitals being given to basically, you know, gifted, I say gifted in quotations there to, um, to the to the natives there to the Lenny Lenapes and unfortunately two of them Chief Mamalte and uh, Turtle Turtle's Heart would be even though they would accept the blankets uh, there and as it's been you know controversial with you know, did this cause or not cause smallpox epidemic there in the native tribes it would be apparent there at the Treaty of Sandwich. Um it would be listed Trent would write them their names in on the the journal so you can only imagine the, the awkwardness it would be and I think. Even today, it's still, you know, talking about this. It was an accomplishment in itself, I think, just because of the Native Council. But the, the Natives were in agreement, at least at that point, the Six Nations in 1768 really wanted to, you know, they wanted to befriend. And I think with William Trent, especially um, his best customers when it came to opening stores, especially in the Indian towns, and even at Fort Pitt, uh, were the Natives. And so I think when Vandalia, if it had become a colony, I think, you know, after the Treaty of Stanwix and what he did in London, I think his goal was to you know, basically involve them. I mean, numerous of the speeches that were given at the Privy Council was we wanted to, if we build a, you know, another fort there or build a city or a settlement, we wanted to make sure they were forts taken care of as well um, there. And unfortunately, like I said, that didn't happen with the eve of the, in the outbreak of the American Revolution. Yeah, somebody commented, I would think they would strongly oppose any dealings with white people after their experience with the walking purchase. Absolutely. And I think I think that was the biggest uh, even during the the like I said, the, what Trent would describe as the late Indian War or Pontiac's Rebellion. Yeah, the, the 
Daniel Hanapes were probably the ones he had numerous treaties with them, and there was always opposition, and rightfully so. You know, honestly, you could see over the years, even before the walking purchase, on why the the natives specifically those those you know Lenape or, or you know the English called them Delaware nations, um, why they were opposed, and you could see why um, at that time. And it, like I said, it never really resolved itself. I mean, from the early 1700s even till you know past the revolution, even further, there was always some kind of controversy or issue, fortunately, that was never resolved. And it's unfortunate because men like William Trent, who, who tried to resolve some of this, you know, would 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 pass on before any of this could even be resolved. Um, you mentioned that William Trent uh, established a ferry that was eventually known as the Continental Ferry. Um, Correct. Were, were his opinions on the American Revolution widely known? Were they published? Was he outspoken? You know, it's funny because he would return and it wasn't even a month after he returned from London there. It was about July of, well, it was June of 1775, end of June. A article published in the, basically in the paper colonies, uh, basically the Virginia Gazette. And it was basically more of a slander uh, thing that was given against because of Trent's uh, known ambitions for this grant that they were trying to get approved that was basically ended any type of Virginia grant that was going in, at least at the time in 1775. Um, and the article said that Trent had made a deal with Lord North and that's for a hundred thousand dollars or so he was going to basically, and this was a direct quote from the Virginia Gazette that he was paid by Lord North, uh, you know, the, the current prime minister to basically announce his loyalties and slit any native's throat that he would see that would have come upon this land. End of which, by November of 1775, Trent would write letters saying that he had to get a retract of this article because this slander that was going on, he feared that if he went to a place that people would know his name, he wouldn't live the even, uh, he would actually worry in danger of his life, essentially, uh, in the life. So by then, um, he had William Bradford, one of the printers in the, basically in Philadelphia for the, um, for the Pennsylvania Journal, uh, retract on November the 5th, 1775, and write an article saying that Trent was cleared of these duties, not only by Virginia government, but also by Pennsylvania, and that this was not, in fact, true, uh, and that it was just a slanderous article that was written. They never did find out who wrote this or published this article, sort of an anonymous thing. But as far as keeping his his loyalties, unfortunately, a lot of his friends, I mentioned William Franklin, uh, he he basically corresponded with William Franklin up till you know, past the Revolution. And, and by 1776, William Franklin would be put on house arrest for conversing with, corresponding with uh, British generals. Eventually, he would flee, knowing he was a loyalist, you know, ironically being the son of founding father, future founding father, Benjamin Franklin, and would flee to London and would never return. He would you know, live his last days there, uh, part of the century there in London. And, you know, Joseph Galloway was another one. Um, he eventually was a member of not only helping with their thing in Vandalia, but eventually would be a member of the Continental Congress. And he would propose a plan of reconciling with Britain when it was revoked, of course, with, you know, with men like Samuel Adams, John Hancock, and Benjamin Franklin saying that they want to start their own nation. Uh, Galloway would would confess his loyalty, basically become a loyalist uh, openly and join the British forces. In fact, going joining uh, Lord Howe there in Philadelphia when, they, when the British took Philadelphia in 1778. And it got to the point that all his friends, so by 1778, Trent would give his oath of allegiance, uh, where he opposed the British government and he approved the American government, at least at the time he wrote, uh, the government in New Jersey uh, and of the Patriot cause there in 1778, because it, it, at this point, it, he was basically being accused because most of his business partners and his friends uh, were loyalists, in fact, loyalists. So, yeah, by 1778, he did he was giving to the Patriot cause. Um, he gave basically, you know, from his location there, even in 1777, there early, um, when Washington crossed the Delaware there, um, he would give uh, supplies to Washington's Continental Army troops. Like I said, he ferried numerous armies across. He even did uh, Daniel Morgan's troops across after the Battle of Saratoga. They stopped there as well as Horatio Gates's officers in the fall of 1777. And so, yeah, so there was early on, it looked like you couldn't really tell the difference, but by 1778, he gave his oath of allegiance to the Patriot cause. Um, and it was 
widely known that at that point, even with the nickname of the Continental Ferry, that which side he was basically, you know, leaning towards. In fact, he wasn't even actually fighting. Uh, do you think his loyalties were influenced by the possibility of getting a grant by supporting the the colonists in their uprising to to affirm the uh, the grant to the Vandalia? I mean, it's quite possible. I mean, I think if you look at if you look at by Vandalia right off the bat, I mean, if it's going to be a royal colony, we're talking it's going to be British rule. And I mentioned before, Quaker Samuel Wharton wouldn't have been the governor; they probably would have given it to George Mercer. And at that point, like I said, it would have been run by Church of England, and it would have been, you know, had the American Revolution not break out, it would have been interesting to see um, exactly what would have happened um, if, in fact, the loyalties happened. But, you know, you look at as further, yeah, what is, did he choose those loyalties because of that? It's hard to say, but I think, um, you know, at, at this point, it seemed at least when he came over, there was, he was like most people, even residents of Trenton, they were just trying to stay out of it. I mean, he, with the age that was going on with him at the time, you figure at this point, he's in his almost in his uh, mid fifties. Um, he's almost too old to be in the military, you know, being that he was already a veteran of free conflict. So it was one of those things where I think he was mostly trying to stay out of it and just trying to prosper. Uh, and uh, for the most part, he did, you know, stay out of it, but he did have to give, you know, like I said, he gave, stuff for that now it's funny because even in in set when british i mentioned british taking over philadelphia lord howe was actually granting um you could have like basically these i guess you could they were like immunities come into the city and trent actually applied for one, receiving one saying that because of his illness and because of his uh trying to work out in, in business papers with indiana he needed to access going into to British, but he was also worried because he wrote a letter to George Crowen, who ailing at the time from Gout uh, in 1777 and was sort of a prisoner in his own house, being that the British ran Philadelphia. Trent was worried that some of his papers would get out, that he would be accused of treason. So at that point, even in 1777, you get a sense that Trent wasn't at all leaning towards that basically loyalty side. He just wanted to prosper and hopefully uh, get back what he what he thought he deserved. Uh, is there any indication that Trent was fluent or corresponded in Native American languages? As far as I know, not really, no. Uh, it's possible he knew, now like Christopher Gist, another uh, basically fellow Indian, basically Indian, I guess liaison you could call it, um, early on and, and even with George Washington, didn't actually speak the languages either. He used basically the language of sign. So it's quite possible numerous times, even by 1758, now this is, Geez, this is probably, you know, 13, 14 years to the point that Trent's been, you know, into the Western country. But 1758, even at Fort Loudon in Pennsylvania, when he's there talking to the Cherokee and, and members of the Six Nations, uh, he still had a, an interpreter with him. So it seemed like he could probably understand it based on the language he could say he could make out a few words. But as far as being fluent, uh, as far as I'm aware of it, based on evidence, it doesn't look like he was. And he sort of, he either had an interpreter with him or he'd able to at least, you know, converse with them enough that he could, they could, he could figure out or understand either through sign or, or familiar words that he recognized. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions, so I think we can go ahead and wrap it there. Anything you want to conclude with, Jason, before we we end it? No, not really. I just appreciate everybody coming out and and uh, here in a uh, basically a uh, you know a presentation and. Uh, very important one, especially, you know, a forgotten one about the life of William Trent. All right. Well, thank you again so much, Jason, for, for doing that. I'm going to post a link to the William Trent house so you can learn more about William Trent, his father, and, and subsequent residents of the house. Um, and thank you so much for shining a light on this kind of hidden part of, of New Jersey history. All right. Great. All right. And then thank you, everybody, for attending. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I just like to say, be safe, be well, and hopefully we'll see you soon.